Some of the most basic facts about Western Hemisphere Indians remain obscure or elusive. Widely varying estimates of the population of the hemisphere in 1492 are one symptom of this. However, even in the late 20th century, the increase in the Indian population of the United States from approximately 764,000 in 1970 to approximately 1,937,000 in 1990 seems difficult to attribute to any plausible rate of fertility. Such a huge increase in just 20 years seems more probably a reflection of social incentives to identify oneself as Indian. Among these incentives were the growing impact of ethnic pride and cultural identity trends, as well as the growing availability of both government and private benefits earmarked for a variety of minority groups, including American Indians. Given that most people who identify themselves as American Indians are not full-blooded Indians, considerable flexibility in self-identification makes it difficult to separate biological increases in this population from changing self-designations in response to changing social incentives. Considering that the number of American Indians barely doubled between the census of 1890, when it was not quite a quarter of a million, to that of 1960, when it was just over half a million, a nearly quadrupling of its size to almost two million in the thirty years after 1960 seems more like a social phenomenon than a biological phenomenon. The sense of historic or inherited guilt has become a major political factor in attempts to redress the wrongs suffered by the indigenous population, particularly in North America. Special privileges and exemptions from the laws affecting other citizens have become common for Indians, both in Canada and in the United States. For example, in the late twentieth century, special hunting and fishing rights for Indians existed in an area constituting one-fourth of the entire land area of Canada, and large economic transfers and special political rights have been conferred as well. However, Indian incomes averaged less than half that of Canadians in general. Most Indians in Canada did not complete high school, and the mortality rates of their infants and young children was three times the national average. In the United States as well, the indigenous people have had special rights and many government programs designed to help them, though it is not clear whether this has in fact made them better off than they would have been otherwise. As the twentieth century neared its end, approximately half of the two million Indians in the United States still lived on reservations, often in a state of dependency. At a time when North Dakota as a whole had an unemployment rate just below two percent, the unemployment rate among Sioux Indians on the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota was 75 percent. <laughs>